I'm a former member of Altinki for five days now. So we had elections now on the 28th of October and I decided not to run again. So it's, it's really actually a pleasure to be here with you as a former politician. But uh, of course I will be talking about uh, things based on my experience as a member of, of Althingi from 2008 to 2017 and also as, as a former Minister of Social Affairs and Housing from 2013 till 2016. So do I use this or with the slides? No, this one. Okay. I'm going to be showing you a lot of pictures from Iceland, some of them quite pleasant, some of them not so pleasant, at least um, in my memory since I did tend to be right in the middle of that. Um, Pre-2007, things were going really well in Iceland. Uh, we, uh, we felt that we were at the top of the world. Um, everything uh, didn't matter which indexes or that that we looked at Iceland was like in the top five or ten along with the other Nordic countries and we felt that we had finally caught up with our fellow uh, uh, brother and cousins in the in the Nordic countries but as you know then in 2007 and 2008 we had the financial crisis and it impacted different countries all over the world, but in a different way. And I think that we can state that uh, at the start that the countries that were impacted most heavily by the crisis were the United States, uh, the UK, Iceland, and then Ireland. Uh, we actually had a joke in, in Iceland saying that, uh, I think it was, what's the difference between Iceland and Ireland? And it was uh, one letter in a few months. So, um, so they actually uh, followed us quite quickly into uh, a severe uh, recession. And so in most countries you have several years of recession or slow economic growth, especially in the North Atlantic area. But among the Nordic countries, and actually I think in most of the comparison to other countries, Iceland was hit the hardest. Um, we do tend to do things quite well when we do something. So we had uh, three large bank and the banks and they all went bankrupt within a week. And, um, and the, the main reason was, um, and, and when, when I say that we do, do, do tend to do things quite well, I do believe that these uh, bankruptcies are in the top 10 or 15 of the largest ones in the world. Not in Iceland or the Nordic countries or Europe, but in the world. So this was... Um, quite a lot. And following uh, their bankruptcy, um, quite rapidly, we had about um, um, a third of the households in the red. Uh, our central bank ba basically went bankrupt. 60% um, of all our companies were also in the red. So it was quite dramatic and quite difficult uh, period. And the reason, well, why? Why do any countries go through difficulties if you look through history? And so the simple answer is debt. We just borrowed too much money. A lot of it foreign money. And you can see uh, this is the, the external debt of the nominal GDP from 2002 to 2000, 2000, 2002 until we reached the top here in 2008. And then it's gone down. Uh, quite rapidly also. So that's the simple answer. But of course, you know, when you ask a question, maybe the answers are quite, never quite as simple as that. What happened here in this area, um, we uh, privatized our banks. We privatized a lot of companies in that time. And, um, and there was quite a, could say, an attitude within Iceland that everything was going well. Uh, our, our living standards had been going up, the banks were doing really well, and, uh, and why bother so much with, with regulations or, you know, different things uh, to decrease the risk behavior. So, uh, the external debt ballooned. And that meant that uh, when 
in October 2008 when, when the banks went bankrupt following, for example, the Lehman Brothers. We had to seek international assistance from the, uh, the International Monetary Fund and from other Nordic countries, were, which helped us. Uh, I think I would also like to mention the Faroe Islands, were, which were the first one to offer assistance, and also Poland, which we were very grateful for. So, what happened afterwards was a lot of protest. And when I say that I was right in the middle of that, I actually came into Parliament in November 2008. So, this is what we had in front of the Parliament every day at that time. And, and since I'm talking about gender, I felt good about actually putting this one in, in the, the first photograph that I showed of the protest, because right here in the middle, it says, women should get power, let's give the men some holiday. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and it, it, looking back, and, and because there were so many things happening at that time, uh, for a whole week, for example, I could not get my car out of the parking garage because of protests. Uh, and it was just, it's just really, really strange to think back about all the things that were happening. Uh, my car was the, the least of it. Um, unemployment skyrocketed. You can see the impact of our GDP going from 2007 to 2008 and then uh, down to there. A little fire also in front of the parliamentary building, which is right there. Unemployment, you can see the way how quickly it went up. It went from being almost non-existent, 1 to 2% in 2008 to do about 9% in 2009. And I know that maybe for a lot of countries, 9% doesn't sound a lot. But for a country that has always emphasized full employment over everything else, that was a huge thing. We have always preferred employment over um, stability, for example. <laughs> as long as we have work, uh, things are good. So, and this happened in a weeks, going from non-existent unemployment up to 9%. Not in a year or something like that. This happened in, in, in a few weeks. So our gross domestic production, they contracted by about 10% in two, thousand, in two years, 2009 and 2010. And of course, private consumption went down a lot and, and just real earnings lowered uh, statistically. You can see that here also. And... Um, so when we look at what happened in other Nordic countries, um, example of uh, Joe K Ketila here earlier, and, and what I've read about and, and what I've heard from my colleagues, uh, what's had happened in the other Nordic countries, um, it's really difficult to compare. Uh, because there are so, so uh, going from being at the top of the world, like I mentioned in the beginning, to the bottom, basically the way we felt it, in a few weeks, it was just a huge shock for everybody in Iceland. We had also a really high level of trust in Iceland, Icelandic society and it just disappeared in weeks. And, uh, and we're still struggling to get that trust back. So, 10 years later, however, because if you can look at the numbers here, you can see things have been improving a lot. And you can also go back here, seeing that the way the employment has gone down. And also, at the moment, we have the, the you know, the, I think the highest growth within the OECD countries. So what happened? What did we do? We did a lot of things wrong, but we must have done something right since we're here. One of the positions that I had as, as a Minister of Social Affairs and Housing was that I was also a, a Minister of Nordic Cooperation and I was also a Minister of uh, Gender Equality within the government. And one of the things that 
whenever I met my other my colleagues, other ministers from other uh, other Nordic countries, one of the things that I felt that I had most in common with the other uh, Nordic ministers was our emphasis on gender equality. Whenever we would be uh, meeting, when we went to um, the UN uh, Women's Meeting in New York, uh, meeting here within the other Nordic countries, um, it was like meeting friends, meeting somebody from the family, because we were talking the same language. And even if we were doing different things, um, we all agreed that gender equality has to be like a guiding principle for the Nordic countries. Um, we, we did disagree in some ways how to actually get there. How do we actually get totally equal country, uh, uh, societies? But we were also, um, we agreed on the importance of you know, basic welfare tasks. We agreed that we had to have a strong social system, healthcare system. Um, we all like taxes. You know, there was not a lot of discussion between us that, that uh, you should not pay taxes. And, and that, that when people need help, that we should be there to help them. And I think these are all parts of what I believe we mean when we talk about the Nordic welfare model. And, but there are also other things uh, that if you look at when we compare ourselves to other countries, what differs us from countries that do have very strong also social system or welfare systems is of course what I mentioned, gender equality, the high level of women's participation in the labor market, actually just high level of anybody in the labor market, whichever groups that you look at, and also the relative even income distribution, and I emphasize income, not capital, income. And, and these are all um, aspects that, that uh, I would like to talk about in, in, in this speech. Uh, the basis for all of this is that we, we have a, a, a good labor market, we have a very well-functioning labor market, and we also have a labor market that all the different three par partners talk to each other. They have uh, even you know, what we call in English, I think, three, uh, three parted agreements. They sit down and they come to agreement on the way that you should um, do a lot of different things. In Iceland, uh, when we had our ma major negotiation in 2015, while I was in government, uh, we agreed on uh, raising uh, the, the, the minimum salary in Iceland significantly. Uh, we agreed on tax policy and we agreed on a housing policy, which was our, the, the state's contribution towards uh, the labor no negotiations. And and I, that, based on what I've heard and read, that that's quite similar to the model that we have in the other Nordic countries. In 2009, right here about, we elected uh, our first female prime minister, Johanna Sigurdardóttir. And it was a left-wing government following uh, a right-center government that had been in government for many, many years. The Social Democrats were in government in 2007 and 2008 uh, with, with the, uh, our uh, right party, the Independence Party. But prior to that, my party, the Progressive Party, and the Independence Party had been in government almost 20 years. Um, so when, when I do talk about what happened, that was, my party was part of that, the Progressive Party. Uh, this is where our president lives, and this is actually it's a combination of protests or not that we're protesting depth at that. They're called the I Say Fight. I don't know if you know about that one. <laughs> so these are some numbers based on what um, has happened since 2009. Um, like I said, we, we elected our first female prime minister. We got the highest uh, level of female parliamentarians in, in, in the parliament then. Um, it has gone up in the la well uh, in the elections 2013 and 2016, but now in uh, the elections 2017 has gone down again to the 2007 
level, which was quite a shock for uh, a lot of people in Iceland now. And the government defined itself as the most feminist uh, of all that we have had. And what was also new that in cooperation with IMF, uh, they agreed on uh, a plan that used a mixture of public cuts and tax hikes to address the financial difficulties. They went the middle way. And that was something that was new for the IMF. They had not done that previously to actually allow, in a way, uh, the, the government to control so much how they would actually uh, manage the, the, the public finance. And when I look also at the different numbers, um, was that the financial crisis impacted the gender in, in very different ways. And I actually w I would like to make here then that when I started working with, with uh, this um, lecture, this speech, I had difficulties with gender versus gender equality. Because it's important to emphasize, are we talking about the gender that there were women or men controlling things that were happening? Did that matter or did the emphasis on gender equality matter? And so that's why I'm, I'm going through the things that happened there in 2009. Also the way that, that uh, the, the financial crisis impacted the genders in different ways. Iceland has one of the most uh, heavily gender segre segregated uh, labor markets of all the Nordic countries. Um, women work in, in the public sector mainly. A lot of, lot of women teach, uh, a lot of women work within, within the healthcare sector, a lot of women work within the care sectors. I know that's similar in also in, in the other Nordic countries, but uh, at least the, the last time I looked at the numbers, we, we were at the top there. Uh, men, then again, they work in the private sector, and, um, and our, the households need to have dual incomes enable to to you know pay for the living standards that they're used to so so we have also one of the highest uh, percentage of women's participation in the labor market and uh, within all the all the Nordic countries and also the OECD and so in 2007 the employment rate for women was 80.8 percent uh, from the age 15 to 64 and 89.1 percent for men and in the crisis, pre-crisis in 2007, the banks had, had stopped being able to borrow money in, in the international markets. So they had stopped lending money, especially to the construction industry. So a lot of men had already lost their jobs uh, prior to the, to the bankruptcy of the banks. Um, and then, um, same with the financial sector, it was dominated by men and they were the ones that lost their jobs uh, when, when the banks went bankrupt. So the, uh, the government policy also of emphasizing uh, this combination and also cutting funds rather for public constructions. If you go to Iceland now, you'll see that uh, impact of that. We have a lot of holes in our roads and, and a lot of things that we need to fix. For example, in, in the Ministry of Welfare that, that I uh, was in, we actually had to leave the building because of mold. So there are just a lot of things that we, would, that we need to work on. But that meant that rather than cutting social and health services, it meant that more men lost their jobs. And, and we also found out, which was uh, really, uh, uh, we discussed a lot, that the gender pay gap uh, decreased in the crisis. And why was that? Because we, people didn't lose their jobs, but they lost the extra payments. And it seemed to be more common that men would have a little extra pay for, you know, for the car or the phone or, or just, you know, something. So when they cut all that out, that meant that the, the gender pay gap uh, decreased. And also um, a lot of the, the men uh, had to work shorter working hours but Icelandic men have, all, have worked longer hours than women have. And, um, and then 
the income distribution also became much more even because we basically just cut off all the ones that were with at the higher end by by you know having 98% of our banking sector go back bankrupt. I don't recommend that way, but uh, that that actually worked in that way. So what they also did at that time, they raised social benefits such as unemployment payments. Uh, social assistance allowance, minimum pension and minimum wage were also raised. And this was all very important for women, because women are more likely to, to um, have, for example, the majority of, uh, they're the majority of claimants for disability payments. And they're also uh, more likely to be the ones who are receiving the minimum old pension, for example. Um, at the same time, uh, I don't know if you know about our uh, parental leave, uh, system. Uh, it's uh, still quite unique in, in the world. Uh, we have it so that you can have nine months of paid leave, three months are uh, tagged to, to the mother uh, and then three months to the other parent and uh, then three months that the, the, the parents can choose whoever takes the leave. And we didn't cut the time but we cut the payments so that impacted more men because they were traditional more uh, got uh, paid more, so it affected especially fathers at the higher end of the income scale. Direct actions that, that were introduced was gender budgeting, and something that I was quite proud of, to actually, even if I was in opposition, I supported that strongly, that a, a law requiring both public and private enterprises to have at least 40% of each gender in the on the board of directors. So, if you look at the example of Iceland, going back to the question that I started with, did gender matter? Did it improve the viability of the Nordic welfare model uh, using the, the example of Iceland? If what, what we have made different decisions if our prime minister would have been a man? would have made different decisions if we would not have higher level of women in the parliament. And I'm not sure. One of the things that I always remember, first, I think it was first or second time that I met a representative of the IMF in Iceland and had a discussion with him. He said that one of the things that surprised him or he found worth mentioning about Iceland was that nobody here is asking to cut your welfare system. Everybody's asking for more money towards it. You don't find any Icelanders saying that we're against welfare. We just disagree on how much money we can put towards it. And but if you look at the fact that historically women and men uh, have not been equal and women have a lot less political economic power and that's the same way still like that in 2017 in Iceland then I do believe that our Prime Minister at that time knew that and she recognized that and coming after that government into uh, the Ministry of Welfare, especially looking at all the different social security systems that we had, there were so many right decisions that were made at that time when it came to our welfare system. So in that way I do believe that that government helped to make the Nordic model more viable in Iceland, to make it stronger in that way because it worked. It showed that you can use unemployment benefits to help people extend the period. You don't have to have it on a permanent basis, but when something happens, you can extend the insurance to help more people. You can open up the education system and make sure that people can go to school rather than staying at home. You can raise the minimum wage. You can look at who are the ones that have the least uh, money when it comes to social security and you can raise that 
these are all decisions that make it so that people know and believe that the system works. But at the same time, I also made the point that you can look at the fact that men in many ways suffered more through the crisis than women did. Especially when a lot of people also blamed the men for the crisis. They were the ones who were responsible for the crisis. We only had men that were running the banks. And we had men in our central bank. And we had men in, um, uh, in the government running everything. So they lost a lot of political and economic status. Some of them went to prison. And And then we had elections. I became a new minister. We had new parties in government. Some called us old parties in government. And, and ever since, I've least believed that gender equality has continued to be a guiding principle. But it's easy to talk about it. It's much more difficult to actually do it. Just do it, as Nike said. <laughs> So, um, we still have gender budgeting. We had a lot of complaints from the men when they came into government about that. Didn't understand it. But it helped to make the right decisions, to have the numbers, as Anita just mentioned here earlier today. Um, we have the public continuing to embrace, as I said, uh, a very comprehensive public responsibility for a welfare. And we have uh, strong social and health sectors, and they're getting stronger as we have more money to put towards it. And we have also, as you can see here, a relatively even income distribution. Something that I, I think it's very important. Labor participation continues to be high. Salary has gone up, and go ahead. No, I didn't have that one. I was looking into one of the things that that was mentioned earlier today when you were talking about the cost of labor. Um, we have actually now one of the highest percentage going towards labor costs in Iceland, and I think that's been important for us. It's meant that uh, the living standards have been able to go up and, uh, and people are doing better. But uh, I think that when, so when you go through a shock like we did in that way, the loss is so much more difficult for us to experience rather than the gain. And and that's why when I go back to, to the lecture here earlier, when, when we talk about how we should actually be studying poverty, how we should actually be bringing out solutions towards poverty, uh, you have to look at the way people behave. And I don't mean to blame them, but to, if you believe that the people will always make rational decisions, if you believe that people will always do a cost and benefit analyze before making up their mind, uh, then we as a politicians will make the wrong decisions. We have to create systems that work with the people. And that was one of the reasons why I was very happy to see that a, a behavior economist actually got the Nobel Prize this year, uh, Richard Taylor. Because that's what, that, that was one of the big questions that I was tackling and trying to find an answer to, and I don't have the answer, I was hoping that you could help me a little bit with that, is that how do you help make sure that somebody does not become poor? How do you make it so that people can get out of poverty? Um, I, from a personal aspect, uh, aspect then um, my mother was 16 when she had me, she was 17 when she had my brother. Uh, my, we lived for the first year uh, with my mother, uh, with our grandparents. Um, they emphasized all the time, even when she was you know, pregnant with me, she had to continue to go to school. 
she had to finish school. Uh, she could stay at home and help them. And they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, my grandmother actually left home when she was like 12 or 13, had to earn her own living. And I've met so many other people that have had similar background to me that have not managed to do or had the opportunities that I've had. And when I sat in, in, with, with the other minister in the Icelandic government, I knew that most of them had different backgrounds from me. Uh, our, my party leader at the time and the other party leader was one of the two most richest men in Iceland. So, so that was always the question that I kept asking myself as a minister of social affairs responsible, responsible for that is that how do you make it, make it so that our welfare model actually helps people? And, and it's just never easy to get the solutions. You can talk about the way things have, what we have done, but can you be sure those are the right solutions? But if you look at the numbers from the Nordic countries, we also know that we do have one of the lowest levels of poverty in the world. Um, we have a really high level of uh, education, literacy, health, life expectancy. There's just so many things that we've done that are right. So that's why I keep asking myself when I meet an individual that has, n has not had uh, the success, for example, that I had, how can I make it sure that if not that person, then at least his or her girl or boy will be able to do that? And, um, and so that's what I'm hoping that you know, a symposium like this will help us with that. Uh, because I, I totally believe that we can make it so that, that people will do well. And gender equality is definitely one of those. And it should not matter whether you are a man or a woman, but it does, still. So, I'm done for now. So, thank you.